Um, well, you, if you got my text this morning, I asked you a question. Do you have a favorite film hero character? And who is your favorite hero from a film? Now, we're, we're not going to go into breakout rooms and discuss all those who they might be. Maybe you can save that up for um, the um, morning tea chat. But I, I can still remember as a 15 year old when no one was looking, whizzing around our campsite at Blair Gowrie like Superman and having come back watching um, the Christopher Reeve movie, Superman. And, and because it, you know, it was such a cool, you know, a real superhero. So who was your favorite super, your favorite hero from a film? I think Hollywood seems to have a fascination with making films about superheroes. In recent years, it's been the Marvel franchise that has captured this the most. And we've had Iron Man and Captain America and Thor and Black Widow and Black Panther and Guardians of the Galaxy. And then just when you haven't got, you've got to really top all that, you bring them all together and you make a series of films called The Avengers. And then of course you can combine that with the DC franchise of films where you've got your Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman. But at the risk of maybe alienating myself from some of you, I actually aren't much of a fan of the super film movies anymore. And I think that's because um, the, the, the way the, the premise behind the movies is that they beat the baddies by being more powerful and often more violent using their unusual and extraordinary powers that no mere ordinary human being can possess. And I, I just don't empathize or identify with them. They don't offer me any real inspiration. In fact, they reinforce for me the idea that the more powerful you are, the better you are. In fact, in their Fantasy kingdoms, the good benevolent superhero stops the evil bad tyrant from ruling over us mere humans by just being more powerful. And while that's a fantasy world, there's something that's actually strangely familiar about that, even in our world. We've just witnessed the Israeli and Palestinian conflict in the Gaza Strip, both sides exercising force and violence to exert their power. We see it playing out in global economics, the Western nations applying trade restrictions on Iran and Northern Korea, China placing some trade restrictions on Australia, each hoping that the economic pain to be an instrument of power to enact some sort of change. And we've seen politicians use the relatively new technology of social media as an instrument of power to enact change, as exemplified by Donald Trump and the storming of the US Capitol building. These are all examples of kingdoms of power that exist in our world. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot about that that I don't like. It raises the question, is there an alternative? Is there a better way? And the scriptures are all about telling us there is a different and better way. Today's scripture, which we read, is one of the shortest parables of Jesus. And it appears almost identically in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I could have chosen any of them for today's readings. We use the Mark version. 
But as small as it is, it offers interesting insights about what God sees or what Jesus sees as the kingdom of God. And the scripture says, again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that birds can perch in its shade. It's, a, it's one of those real helpful parables because it immediately tells us what the parable is about. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? In fact, Jesus goes on, almost pondering, what parable shall I use? What story shall I use to describe it? We are fortunate to know that whatever the story is that Jesus is about to say, it's attributed, it's to be attributed to the kingdom of God. But when you hear that phrase, kingdom of God, what does it, what does it mean for you? When we read it, when we see it, what immediately goes on in your head? In Jesus' day, the kingdom of God was packed. That phrase was packed with deep traditional and historical meaning. It goes right back to the very beginning of the Bible, very beginning of the scriptures. It goes right back to Genesis. And our call as humans behaving in the image of God to rule the earth. In Genesis 1, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the earth. God saw all he made and it was very good. A key point of the creation story was that God created mankind with a task to exercise rule, dominion, kingship over his world. And the concept, God's plan, was really pleasing to God. Humans acting in the image of God on the behalf of God in God's created kingdom. However, one of the, the big next points of the creation story is that instead of mankind ruling in partnership and with right relationship with God, mankind goes it alone and starts this sequence, this cycle of self-rule that repeats itself over and over throughout the scriptures and well, over and over throughout the world since. Individuals, families, tribes, right up to whole nations, not living under God's rule as their king. In the book of 1 Samuel, in the Bible, we read Israel as a nation had God as king, but rejected God for a human king. And that didn't end well with the nation itself being overrun and ruled by a series of foreign nations and kings. And at the very time that Jesus is telling this parable, Israel was under the dominion of Rome and their emperor and their king, Caesar. And you might remember on the, night, on the trial <coughs> with Pilate, um, the religious leaders, keep screaming out, crucify Jesus. And when Pilate says, but isn't he your king? They all yell out, no, we have no king but Caesar. So think about what an awesome question Jesus is asking when he says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall we say? It's like whatever example Jesus was to bring, it was to be held 
in contrast to everything they knew and were experiencing about kingship. And the same contrast applies to us today. While the Roman Empire is long gone, we have our own empires of today that rule and control our lives. Media empires, global trade empires, military empires and technological empires. And the question for us is, how do they stand in contrast or in contradiction to God's kingdom's reign? Well, what did Jesus say that that kingdom of God was like? It's like a mustard seed, although very small, once planted, capable of growing into a tremendous plant, capable of attracting birds with its shelter. Now, if we had time and we were to pause and go into rooms again, I would actually ask you this question. I'd say, think of that scripture. What was the main point that Jesus was making? But I've kind of listed here, and you've got a multiple choice to look at. Here are some possible main points. Is Jesus making a comparison of small to large, obviously the smallest of seeds becoming a big bush. The need for something to be intentionally planted without something, without that seed, if it's not planted, doesn't do anything. Maybe it's about the rigorous and vigorous speed of growth. The mustard seed is a really rapid, vigorous growing plant. It's from, it's an annual, it's a, it only lasts for one season. So it's planted and it grows quickly into this great bush. Maybe it's about the gathering of the birds, something done as in something done for a purpose. The, um, some of the Old Testament, some of the uh, commentaries and biblical scholars actually refer this part of the scripture back to Daniel, where there's um, scriptures that talk about the gathering of the nations, the gathering of people. And so that maybe that's the main point of the, um, of the parable. Maybe the main point is about the provision of a protected place that offers nurture, as in for the birds having shelter. Or, and this might seem very strange to many of us who have grown up with the more traditional view of this parable, there's a group of uh, scholars who say, no, the point of this parable is that it's about the, um, the subversive nature of a weed being planted in the garden. Back in those days, the mustard seed was seen like a weed. It's a bit like um, today, if we were doing a modern Australian version of this, we would say it was the seed of a blackberry bush planted into a garden that quickly spreads. And the, um, and the thought is, that what Jesus was saying that the kingdom of God is about the coming of something that is that disrupts and changes the um, the status quo of whatever's happening. But maybe it's all of the above. Maybe all those things play out in this parable. Just give you some time, just pause for a tick. What's resonating with you at the moment about those things I've just said? What do you think is the point Jesus wanted people to contrast the king, God's kingdom to the kingdom 
of the world that they were living in. What do you think Jesus' point is? That we take the contrast God's kingdom to the world kingdom empires of the world that we live in. Unlike some of those parables, um, none of the gospels record Jesus giving an explanation to its meaning. And from, as I've said, from the many commentaries or the various commentaries I've read, any or all of that list could have been possible focuses of the parable, which when you think about it, for two short verses makes the potential impact of this parable really incredible. So, in contrast to the world we live in, what if Jesus is telling us that in God's kingdom, it will be the small things we can do that can quickly bring the biggest impact? Like, as someone shared, like providing food in the food bank to feed and nourish people or the way God used a small, diminutive, but determined nun in Mother Teresa to gather and protect thousands of disadvantaged people in India. What if in God's kingdom, it's about intentionality, having a go, planting something, trying something with the purpose to care and shelter or love, or starting something that is a little disruptive to the status quo, like fighting for reconciliation, treaty, or truth-telling about the kingship of Australia and its treatment over the land's Indigenous people. What if the whole point of the parable is to remind you and me as disciples of Jesus and therefore citizens of the kingdom of God, as small and as insignificant we can feel in a world that is dominated by political powers and COVID pandemics and lockdowns, that we too can intentionally plant or do the smallest of actions that could have a huge impact on our next door neighbor, on our classmate, on the infirmed lady that lives across the street or the lonely man standing beside you at a bus stop. Now, just as in Jesus's day, the kingdom of humans was dominated by the big getting bigger, the powerful getting more powerful, the wealthier more wealthy, the healthier more healthy, and often all at the expense of those who have little power, little wealth, or health. But in the kingdom of God, God empowers the smallest, the seemingly insignificant to achieve great things that serve the outcome of others. As I was reflecting on the question, who is my favorite film hero? I think I'd have to say it's the character that Tom Hanks plays in Saving Private Ryan. Captain John Miller, the school teacher that leads his squad across a worn torn Europe in search of a paratrooper. I like it because it's a story of the small and the ordinary. I'm able to empathize with that. I'm able to identify with that. I particularly 
loved the final scene as the family of the paratrooper are gathered around and the big ongoing legacy left by the intentional actions of a small school teacher. Unlike the imaginary fantasy world of superheroes, God's kingdom is present here and now in the lives and actions of the disciples of Jesus in you and in me. We are the small ones who intentionally can do great things, empowered by God, who can make big impact in the lives of others. What if the whole point of the parable is to remind you and me as disciples of Jesus and therefore citizens of the kingdom of God, that we, as small as we are, can start something that will impact the community around us as we demonstrate sacrificial love. So my challenge or invitation to you this week and my question for you is this. What are you going to intentionally do this week? What mustard seed are you going to plant in partnership with God as part of his kingdom? Let me pray. Loving God, I just thank you that in your kingdom, your message is to us, to everyone, to the lonely, to the small, to the marginalized, that you use those that are often the weakest and that you, through your love and your spirit in us, we can then impact the world. Thank you, Lord, that I can, we can identify with that that we can be your instruments and make an impact, a big impact on the world. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit to enable us to be that vigorous, growing action in the world, that through the actions we do, people will see you recognize your love for them through us. We ask these things in your son's mighty name. Amen.